And in this um, class, we're going to continue our discussion of Martin Luther King and civil disobedience. And we're looking this week at these two um, essays that King wrote, Letter from Birmingham Jail and Love, Law and Civil Disobedience. So I want to discuss those a bit more today and just pick out some of the important things that, that King might have, the important concepts King mentioned in these essays. And earlier we, we talked about King's view of unjust laws and the idea of um, the idea of, of justice and natural law, and that's a that's a that's a significant part of of King's defense of his idea of of civil disobedience that there are unjust laws, and unjust laws merit to be broken. And again, he sort of uses Saint Augustine's idea uh, of an unjust law is no law at all, so it's not it's not even genuine law. Um, if a law is unjust, if it doesn't correspond with God's moral law. So that's really a, a fundamental argument, as we saw in the letter from Birmingham Jail, and fundamental to King's justification of the idea of civil disobedience. So in, in this discussion, I want to pick up on some further aspects of King's view and, and sort of give a, a little bit more of a, um, a sort of historical situating of, of King and and, um, and and how his idea of civil disobedience worked in that context. All right, so in, um, in the 60s, King received this letter from the FBI. Um, and the point of this letter, if, if, you, if you read it through fully, um, you'll, you'll sort of see the, you'll see the tone and you'll see the, the sort of intention here. Um, and it's, it's sort of generally referred to as the suicide letter. So um, the, the FBI sent this letter to King ostensibly to encourage him to commit suicide. And if, if you read the, the letter, that seems to be very much the, the sort of in, intention that there's sort of evil goings on. There are these um, filthy, abnormal animals. This sort of language is redolent sexual orgies and this sort of language you'll find in the, in the letter sort of accusing, um, accusing thing, ac accusing King um, of these sort of rather explicit sexual misdeeds, which are nonetheless not really, not really sort of precisely noted, but more sort of evoking this air of um, sexual crime and abomination and so on, um, and sort of, you know, describing King as a fraud, um, and then sort of, uh, uh, sort of threatening this sort of big exposure um, at the end. So, so it's it's sort of it, it's it reflects the the sort of fear felt by American institutions at, at the time um, of what King represented, um, and the sort of fear um, of those institutions of what would happen if King became sort of broadly popular in American society, um, and the you know the sort of target of this attack on King's are these sort of talks of. Um, these rumors of sexuality, um, you know, when 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 you look back at the civil rights movement and, and a lot of um, a lot of organizations at this time, um, you know, in the fifties and sixties, it was sort of very much, um, you know, organized on the basis of authority, um, hierarchical organizations, and often the people at the top of those organizations, who of course tended to be men, um, tended, you know, did have a lot of freedom to. Um, convey their power into um, into other realms such as sexuality, and so there's there's a sort of suggestion that this is um, this is something that that King was was up to, and there are there are these sort of these rumors are sort of um, constant about the civil rights movements of this kind of thing, and as we will discuss later, there's a kind of um, there's a kind of learning of of more recent elements of the movement that this is not. It's not really a good thing to give the leaders so much power. They can sort of be co-opted and, and attacked in this way by, um, you know, by the FBI and other institutions if if they sort of, um, you know, do things which can bring the the sort of persuasive and blackmail power of these institutions upon them. So um, so so this was something that that King faced in his lifetime, um, and it I think this 
mostly I think this essay, this this letter reflects the sort of fear about um, King and what he represented that was part of American institutions at the time. So what's interesting, I think, if, if we sort of, again, if we try and look at this in, in context, we know today that, um, you know, we're all familiar with Martin Luther King Day and we know that King is a revered figure in American society. But it's interesting to, to see and it's interesting to see in these in these sort of historical um, samples that this hasn't always been the case. Um, and in fact, you know, that's something that's only emerged in recent decades. Right. So if we look when King was sort of active and actively marching um, and representing um, his community, we see a very different picture. Right. We see um, he's sort of broadly favorable, favorable in 63 and 64 when the movement is in its infant, infancy. That starts to change um, in 65 and 66 uh, when King becomes noticeably more unpopular. And one thing that's definitely driving this um, heightened unpopularity is King's opposition to the Vietnam War. Um, in, in the late 60s, that becomes increasingly prevalent and Vietnam becomes an increasingly um, contentious and fraught political issue. So King's stance in opposition to the to the Vietnam War is is very much a um, something that, that, that causes, um, you know, a great decline in his favorability. Um, the American public is still broadly, um, broadly supportive at this time. Um, so, so, and, and that continues to happen throughout the 1960s as King's attention shifts to sort of economic and social justice, um, sort of drawing on from from the idea of civil rights, um, and that sort of makes him um, increasingly unfavorable. So, you can see the shift to today, sort of, you know, 2011. I'm sure th um, things are very similar today. You get a very high favorability rating um, and a very low and favorable rating. But again, we have to ask ourselves how much of that a difference in favorability to today is a result of people not really having to sort of reckon with the king with the things King said on a serious on a sort of day to day basis as a serious, um, you know, as a sort of serious accusation charge and whether today we have a much more um, just a maybe a much less precise and a much less accurate picture of the things that King represented. And so that sort of drives this higher, higher favorability as though King was a kind of, um, you know, very much a, a kind of a, a, a lukewarm kind of figure who didn't really do or say anything controversial, but, you know, let people be free. And I think this is um, this is not a fair reflection of his legacy. And so the um, the, the you know, the the sort of shift in favorability tells us something else, um, something else was was going on. So it's interesting to sort of look at these figures in context. Now, we could, if, if we look at where King was in 1967, um, again, you know, shortly before, um, shortly before his death, when he's sort of starting to think more broadly about social and economic justice and he writes an essay, Nonviolence and Social Change. Um, and this is in the week eight folder if you want to look at this essay and, and sort of um, consider it more deeply. It's it's posted in the in the week eight folder. So King King begins the essay by talking about this sense of emergency, right? There's nothing wrong with the traffic law, which says you have to stop for a red light, but when there's a fire, you just go straight through the light. Um, and he continues, there's a fire raging now for the Negroes and poor of this society. They are living in tra tragic conditions because of this terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in as an underclass, as the sociologists are now calling it. So King's sort of picking up on um, things that are emerging from sociology, this idea of an underclass, and it's, it's sustained by economic policy and deeply entrenched economic injustices. Um, and and that's where his attention is sort of turning here, um, which sort of broadens um, the, 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 the focus of civil rights to include economic justice. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the poetry of his language here, it's, of his language here is very stark. Um, you know, disinherited people all over the world are bleeding to death from deep 
social and economic wounds. Um, so it's, you know, this sense of urgency, the sense of emergency um, emerges very, very clearly in this 1967 essay. Um, and he says, massive civil disobedience is a strategy for social change which is at least as forceful as an ambulance with its siren on full. So here sort of talking about massive civil disobedience um, in a context in which there is an emergency, you know, society is bleeding to death from deep economic and social wounds and something desperate needs to be done. So this was, um, I think this gives us a, a good indication of King's mindset in 1967. And he continues in this essay to say that, of course, by now it is obvious that new laws are not enough. The emergency we now face is economic and it is a desperate and worsening situation. Um, for the 35 million poor people, there is a kind of strangulation in the air. Um, again, the sense of emergency. Um, it is murder psychologically to deprive a man of a job or an income. So King's you know, focusing on social and economic questions here um and sort of using envisioning the idea of of a program of non-violence and massive civil disobedience to sort of deal with this situation um and so we can see that that connection that the connections that kings are make that king is making and the broadening of the civil rights movement that is attempting to um the broadening of focus that he's trying to sort of put into practice here All right, let's look at, let's go back to the to the letter and to sort of talk about um, a couple of things that that King mentions there that we didn't we didn't talk about um, in the previous video. I think there's a couple of interesting points um, towards the end. One of them is on time. And King uses this really nice phrase uh, where he says, we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. So the idea here is, is he's fighting against this, what he calls this neutral idea of time. Um, and of course that's embodied in, in calls from people who say, um, you know, this, the, that there's no need to force the issue. If we wait, things will happen, right? So if, if you wait, society will change and we'll get, you know, we'll get justice without um, without any bloodshed, without any violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's this view of sort of times neutrality that it's, that it's inevitably going to um, it's going to move in the right direction. It's going to move towards justice. We just have to wait for it to happen. And King says that's an illusion. He says it it never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. In other words, whether whether history moves in a direction that's that's in favor of progress and justice or against it depends on what human beings do, right? Depends on who puts their shoulder to the wheel and what they do uh, when they try to influence the course of, of events and influence the course of history, right? So so the civil, the civil rights movement puts its shoulder to the wheel and makes history turn towards justice. But if it hadn't done that, Right, we can't expect that time's inevitably going to move in that direction. Right, so time is not a neutral thing. We have to make it move in the right direction, and the way that we do that is is with human action um, that sort of turns the wheel and makes it turn in the right direction. Another thing that King talks about in the essay um, is this idea of extremism and the question of of what kind of extremists we will be. Um, and so with this quote, what he's doing um, is his is rejecting the is rejecting the critique of extremism. Right. And again, this this sort of goes with the neutrality of time idea, the, the idea that, you know, that the problem are extremists. Right. If we just let people sort out their problems in a sort of humane way. Right. If we don't sort of, um, you know, rouse people up and have them marching in the streets, um, which is allegedly extremist. Um, but if we just sort of, you know, have people um, talking together and sort of keep keeping community and sort of trying to. Um, not to uh, not to not to push authority or not to demand things of authority, um, but to sort of work with it. So not being an extremist in that sense, 
And King says that's an illusion, that it's it's not, the problem isn't whether or not we're extremists, the problem is what kind of extremists we will be. In other words, we, we will we be extremists for the status quo and injustice, or will we be extremists for justice um, and and equality? So that's sort of King's um, that's King's thinking that it's not. So so of course the the, the perspective of of the moderate that we just sort of wait and let things happen, we let um, you know authorities sort things out. Um, that's not a good solution, right? We, we have to sort of make things happen and it's people taking action, um, people standing up for justice and people doing things on behalf of justice that makes things happen, that makes the wheel turn. And if we don't do those things, if, if we're not extremist, um, if that's the word to use in this sense, right, then nothing's going to happen. Society is not going to change. So. In Love, Law and Civil Disobedience, King follows Gandhi um, in outlining three options for people suffering oppression. And the first one is, is the idea of acquiescence, um, adjusting oneself to oppressive conditions. Um, and he says a lot of people have given up, a lot of people in the black community have sort of given up and made their peace with, uh, with oppression. And then he talks about another solution that a lot of, um, a lot of people are are advocating as as well, and that's becoming popular, and that's rising up through, uh, rising up against the oppressor, th against the oppressor through hatred and physical violence. And King identifies some elements of black nationalism that have that have sort of taken that stand of, of sort of opposition and hatred, um, and have sort of found that a, a sort of a, a way of a way of fostering a kind of opposition. But of course, for King, it's not it's not the right kind of opposition. So the third and the and the best option for him um, is the idea of nonviolent resistance popularized by Gandhi. So this is like Gandhi. King sees this as the solution uh, for, for people in a situation where you have two antagonistic groups. Right. For Gandhi, the Indian people under the yoke of British rule and for King. Um, it's the black population suffering under segregation um, against the majority white population in the United States uh, in the South where segregation is sort of legally enforced. So, so that's the target and King is saying that can be attacked by this kind of nonviolent resistance. King also talks about three forms of love in the Love, Law and Civil Disobedience essay. Um, and these three forms come from Greek thinking. Um, there are there's a there's additional um, additional sort of variants as, as well, but the main ones here are eros, which is usually a kind of sexual or romantic love. There's philia, which is a kind of friendship, a kind of a kind of love between friends or a sort of an affectionate relationship between community members. And then finally, agape or redemptive love, as in love, love your enemies. Um, so agape is is kind of God's love for human beings, um, and King identifies that with the kind of love that, um, the kind of love that is at, at stake in the student movement, um, and in movements practicing civil disobedience. Right, it, it, you need to reach that kind of perspective. Um, where you can love your enemies. And King has this interesting phrase where he says it's it's really difficult to like people sometimes, but but you can sort of love them in this agape sense. Um, so it, it's not a sort of personal, you know, it's not a sort of personal liking or an affection. It's it's a kind of it's this redemptive idea that we're all human. So we're all part of the human family um, and there's humanity in all of us. So it, it has that sort of focus that it's a sort of common humanity thing. And we're even though we're we're sort of hating the things that other people might do, we're sort of loving the common humanity in them as well. And again, some of this goes back to Gandhi's ideas of sort of love for the oppressor, of sort of showing love and, and sort of not um, not succumbing to this to this hatred and resentment. Um, and so King takes a lot of that on board and finds finds in the Christian tradition similar kind of ideas in this idea of agape, which is, as I said, is usually sort of thought of as God's love for human beings. 
um, and King finds it useful as a as a way of thinking about the attitude of the the civil civilly disobedient person. Now King uses the phrase and the negative piece in this essay as, as well. And a negative piece is a situation in which there is an absence of tension, but not justice. All right, so it's it's a that's the, the peace part is the absence of tension, but it's negative because it doesn't um, it doesn't include or embody real justice. So it's it's a sort of unjust situation which is peaceful, uh, which doesn't have conflict. So when moderates accuse King and his followers of stirring up tension and conflict, right? King charges that they are actually defending a negative peace. Right, and his his point is if, if you want to get past a negative peace, then you have to have tension and conflict. Right. So when you when you draw up this tension and conflict, um, you know, people are often going to complain that, you know, why are you creating this why are you creating this sort of chaotic situation? Why why this conflict? Um, and the idea of negative peace is to convey this idea that that creating that situation is a way of of bringing about a transformation from a situation of of, of an absence of tension but not justice to a situation in which you can remedy that towards a kind of positive peace, um, a peace that would be where you would have peace but also justice. And there's no way of getting from one to the other without stirring up this condition of tension. And it's interesting, you know, going back to the letter on Birmingham jail, letter of, from Birmingham jail, where King talks about Socrates and the creation of tension. Um, and he, he sort of sees a similar process in what civil disobedience does, right? So Socrates creates a tension in somebody's mind by raising critical questions. That tension leads them to a sort of greater understanding of the issue, whether it's justice or whatever else. For King, it's civil disobedience that sort of plays that role of creating tension. And as a result, it leads society to a sort of greater, a greater, more encompassing sense of justice. And society is able to live by this sort of more encompassing sense of justice. All right, just to finish up, um, I wanted to show you one essay that's um, that's tried to make connections between King um, and sort of more recent uh, movements for social justice. Here, the Black Lives Matter movement. Again, in the week eight folder, I've I've posted a number of essays um, about Black Lives Matter. You can go in and, and have a look and see um, some of the discussions there. I think this essay is interesting because it sort of makes some comments about about King and the earlier civil rights movement um, in relation to sort of new developments. So in this essay, um, Frederick Harris, the author, talks about some of these um, some of these important shifts and the uh, the interesting phrase here that the current wave of protest is not your grandmama's civil rights movement. Um, and partly what is getting at here, and you can sort of see in this passage, um, is the sort of tactical use of technology by the movement, the way. Today, for example, think of how you're able to mobilize hundreds and thousands of people through social media. Um, in the 1960s, you had to hand crank out leaflets to sort of get the word out about a protest. Right. So that that, that sort of radically changed organizing and, and made it easier in some sense, but also harder to control it in others. Right. And in terms of speed, you can sort of reach individuals instantaneously, um, you know, frame events instantly and sort of uh, and, pr and broadcast them um, to hundreds of thousands of followers, creating an instant mobilization. Um, so this has sort of changed the way that um, pe people are able to perform um, activism and change the way they're able to sort of interact, um, which means that, you know, so a lot of movements today have adjusted to this kind of action and this kind of immediate focus that's sort of become a necessity. Um, in this in the current media climate. Another thing here, um, apart from the tactical and technological differences um, which separate the movement, another thing that 
Harris talks about is the rejection of the charismatic leader model. And here's, here's what he says about King in relation to this model. He says, this older model is associated with Martin Luther King and the clergy-based male-centered hierarchical structure of the organization he led, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In the ensuing years, this charismatic model was replicated by Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push, Al Sharpton's National Action Network, um, and hundreds of others. But Black Lives Matter activists today recognize that granting decision-making power to a, an individual or a handful of individuals um, poses a risk to the, durality, to the durability of the movement because charismatic leaders can be co-opted by powerful interests or place their own interest above that as a collective. Can, they can be targeted by government repression or even assassinated as were King and Malcolm X. Right, so this is the problem of sort of charismatic leaders who, in a, in a male-centered hierarchical structure, who have a lot of power. And we, we saw earlier with the FBI letter, uh, one of the sort of ways that made the civil rights movement vulnerable, that the FBI could sort of target King, they could try to blackmail him and sort of put this psychological pressure to try and get him to commit suicide and so on. So, so you know, they're, so they're trying to sort of damage the movement by by going after the um, the leader and sort of um, and sort of attacking the, uh, the the sort of charismatic leader. So by having a, a by sort of having a much flatter high, a much flatter organizing structure, um, this group centered model of leadership rooted in ideas of participatory democracy, um, you, you offset that problem, right? You, leaders can't be co-opted, they can't be assassinated, or if they are, it doesn't damage the movement. Um, and this leads to a much sort of flatter organizing model that's, that's sort of more able to move fluidly. And it, it sort of it, it eliminates a lot of the problems with the older hierarchical model. Of course, it has its own problems. It's much harder to sort of have a common voice and things like that, but it's it's interesting in our context to see ways in which the movement has learned from errors of, of King and the older civil rights movement. All right, let's talk about a number of conclusions that we can think about uh, from this week. So King develops a theory of civil disobedience, as we saw, focused on the idea of unjust laws and he has a theory of what makes something an unjust law, as, as we saw, um, and that's based on the natural law tradition, right? So King's theory is about what it uplifts human personality, what makes us whole, what makes us one humanity. Um, but he also talks about this idea of sameness made legal, treating people equally. So that's sort of two different sort of dimensions or ways of looking at his idea of just law versus unjust law. So King uses that idea to, to say that um, certain kinds of laws are unjust, and those are the ones that, that, that are legitimate targets of civil disobedience. So we saw also that King was a controversial figure in his time because of the stances he took on the Vietnam War and, the ec and economic and social justice. So King was very unpopular in his time, and we saw him starting to make connections in the late 1960s to economic and social justice, uh, which again sort of made him a, controver a more controversial figure um, leading up to his assassination. But that's because he, um, you know, he was sort of making these connections that brought, um, you know, increasingly different dimensions of society into the scope of his critique. So King learned a great deal from Gandhi and Thoreau, especially, uh, we saw from Gandhi, he sort of especially took the idea of of this idea of civil disobedience as a form of love um, and a sort of love for your opponents and all of that kind of thing that was part of Gandhi's whole uh, whole approach. And Thoreau's idea of conscience that as we saw influenced Gandhi and, and King takes that on board as well, the idea of, that all human beings have a conscience, that we, you know, we can turn people around. Uh, we can sort of change their minds. So there's there's a sort of optimism about King's view, I think, that reflects what we saw in Gandhi and Thoreau. In turn, as we saw more recent movements 
like Black Lives Matter have learned from King and the civil rights movements, learned in terms of tactics and technology, but also in terms of organization. Um, so we can see this as a sort of, and that's maybe a nice conclusion here, that this is a, a an ongoing process as we sort of finish up civil disobedience. Here we can see that uh, we, we've sort of told a story of the progression of civil disobedience as it became something that is used to um, to sort of bring about social transformation in, in this context of a struggle among groups. Um, and we see a sort of continual learning process and also an adjusting process as different people and different thinkers try to adjust um, the goals of the movement to existing you know, to the existing social framework to make it valid and to make it viable within that framework. Um, so as we can see, that's a kind of ongoing process that always, that sort of always happens when, whenever you have a new stage um, and a new kind of rebirth of thinking about um, civil disobedience and civil rights.